This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Windows 10 Basics class. In this class, yes, we'll be covering the Windows 10 operating system, all right, but we're also going to uh, talk a little bit more generally about the personal computer. Okay, so this is a great class for beginners um, or some of you who might have a PC at home, you're using a while, but you just want to learn more about how the PC works and kind of a little more about what makes Windows 10 Windows 10. All right, so um, now just a quick note here before I talk about what we'll be, um, before we kind of launch into the lecture here, um, there has been a newer uh, edition of Windows release, that's Windows 11, okay, has it, it was released um, in the past few months, and you might be seeing that on new PCs, okay, um, or if you are a current Windows 10 user, you may be getting uh, notifications or pop-up messages asking you to update to Windows 11. Um, so just to let you know, you do not have to update to Windows 11 right now. Uh, Windows 10 will be, it will continue to be supported through um, October of 2025. Okay, so that means that you'll still be getting um, updates for Windows 10, security updates, things like that just to kind of beef up security and enhance the operating system. So again, if you are a current Windows 10 user and um, you don't want to necessarily move on to Windows 11 right now, you don't have to. Um, Windows 10 will, be, will continue to be supported through October of 2025. That also means that um, this class is still highly relevant because many people are gonna, they're still comfortable using Windows 10 that they just wanna keep using it without moving on to Windows 11 right now. All right, so whatever you learn in this class, is still highly relevant, and in fact, many things um, still operate the same way in Windows 11. Okay, so the, the, the two editions of Windows are relatively similar. All right, so let's talk about what we'll be doing today, and then we'll jump into talking about the PC. So we're gonna learn the names for parts of the computer and become acquainted with lots of computer terminology. We'll talk about the Windows 10 operating system, the proper way to turn on and off your computer. Okay, there is an ideal way to shut down your computer. And in the end, we'll become more comfortable with using the computer. All right, so let's start there with what is a computer? So it's a machine designed for manipulating data according to a list of instructions known as a program. Okay, so you're basically, that just means that the computer you're using um, is in, has installed a number of different programs that perform different tasks. Some tasks that you do yourself, some tasks that basically the computer needs to perform specific operations. All right, uh, a computer is extremely versatile and it's composed of hardware and software. Okay, so um, in a minute, we're gonna kind of break down hardware and software. It helps to kind of look at the computer in those two categories. All right, but first let's just talk about this term PC, okay? You've probably seen the, the, the term PC before, which of course just stands for personal computer, okay? And PCs come in many forms, desktops, like we see on the screen right now, these typically stay in one place. We have laptops, which are portable. You could fold them up, take them somewhere else. And then we have mobile devices like tablets and smartphones. All right, those are also considered PCs. Now, um, a quick note here. You may be, uh, if you've ever shopped for a computer, whether it's online or in a store, you may know that uh, computers are often divided into two categories, PCs and Macs, okay, or Apple. Um, technically speaking, Macs are PCs because they are in themselves personal computers. Okay, iPhones, same thing. However, um, they, they kind of separate themselves uh, basically for two reasons. Number one, just to kind of separate their brand so they stand out. Uh, also though, they're, uh, they have a different operating system and things on Macs work a little bit differently than they do on other PCs. So what we'll be covering in this class and all of our computer classes really pertains to PCs, not Macs, okay? Um, PCs include brands like Toshiba, Dell, HP, Acer, okay? So again, just to, just just to let you know that we are primarily looking at we're working at the Windows 10 operating system, which is used on PCs, not Macs. Now, what do you need to get started with your PC? Well, you need hardware, the physical parts of the computer, 
some parts that you can see, some parts that you cannot see. You need software. These are the programs installed on the computer, all right, that basically allow you to perform specific tasks. If you want to type up a document, there's a program for that. If you want to browse the internet, there's a program for that. And some programs aren't really for your use. They're really just to let the computer run on its own. And then we also have the operating system. You need you op, you definitely need this as the everyday user. So the operating system, it controls the hardware and software of the computer. So it's basically what allows you as the everyday user who doesn't know a whole lot about computers to be able to manage the hardware and software programs with relative ease. You don't need to be an expert, okay? It's kind of intuitive and it puts everything into a, it kind of organizes all of your stuff into a system that's again, relatively easy to navigate. Okay, it's again, it's intuitive. Um, you don't need to be an expert to kind of understand how to use these things. So let's talk about hardware first. So hardware um, comprises the physical parts of the computer. We have external hardware, we have internal hardware. All right, so the external hardware, of course, refers to the parts that you can see right now when you're looking at your computer. So we have two examples here, a desktop and a laptop. All right, um, so let's look at the desktop on the left. All right, external hardware, we have a monitor here. We have a mouse, we have a keyboard. All right, we can see those. We also have the tower, which I'll talk about in just a second in more detail. On the laptop, we have, we have many of the same um, hardware devices we just mentioned, except this has a touchpad as well, okay? which we often use instead of a mouse on a laptop, but you can plug in a mouse to a laptop as well. So you can really have both. Now we also have internal hardware. Internal hardware is inside the computer itself. Internal hardware refers to things like the motherboard or the main circuit board of the computer and your hard drive or hard disk, which we'll talk about in more detail in just a minute. Let me just change my pen color here, great. All right, so let's go back to that tower for one second because I want to mention this as well. So this, uh, what's called the tower here, all right, the more sort of general term for this, I'll, I'll kind of write this as best as I can, is the CPU or the, or the central processing unit, okay? That's basically the computer itself, all right? And that's where that, a lot of that internal hardware is located, your motherboard, your hard drive. Now, um, it's in this case, we're calling it a tower because it's that kind of tall vertical style of a CPU. Uh, nowadays, you might not see this quite as often. All right, CPUs come in different shapes and sizes. So yours might look different if you, if you have a desktop and that's okay. All right, so some CPUs are, they might lie down horizontally and be placed underneath the monitor here. Some CPUs might stand vertically, but they're much shorter, almost like the size of a book, okay? Um, and some CPUs, even on a desktop, they're built into the monitor itself. Okay, so it all depends on the desktop you're purchasing, but the CPU, sometimes called the tower, is basically the computer itself. And then all the other devices you see here basically allow you to use that CPU. Now, we can further break down hardware into two more specific categories, input devices, and output devices. So some hardware devices allow you to put things into the computer. Okay, some hardware devices allow you to take allow you to take things out from the computer. Okay, so we have some examples here of input devices on the left side. Um, I won't go through all of them. Some of them are fairly obvious. Uh, we have our keyboard, which allows us to type into the computer and then words show up on the screen. Okay, therefore it's an input device. We have a scanner which allows us to take a real life or physical object, like a document or a picture, scan an image of it and save it as a file on our computer. Therefore, it's an input device, okay? A microphone you speak into so that people connected to your computer can hear you or you can record yourself. Therefore, it's an input device. Now, I'll, I'll come to disks and drives in a second. On the right side, we have output devices. Again, devices that allow you to take that kind of take things out of the computer. So a monitor projects an image out to you, therefore it's an output device. A printer 
takes something that's saved on your computer and prints it out as a physical copy. Therefore, it's an output device. All right, speakers project volume out to you. Therefore, speakers are output devices. Now, you'll notice that disks and drives are located under both categories, input and output. If you're, if you're not familiar with the term disk or drive, we could use those two terms um, synonymously. These are basically where everything is saved on the computer, your files and other uh, files and programs that the computer needs to run. So why is it located under both input and output? Because um, you could use, uh, well, let's put it this way. You can retrieve information stored on a disk by putting its information into your computer. All right, in that case, it would be an input device. You could also take information out of your computer and store it on a disk. So uh, it also works in out, as an output device. So in other words, um, the files that are saved on your computer, your documents, your music, videos, whatever, pictures, um, you can basically move them in and out of the computer as needed. Now, let's talk about that. Let's kind of hone in on file storage more specifically, and then we'll come back to software. All right, so let's stay on the topic of disks and drives because this is super important, especially when we're using our Windows 10 operating system. So when we save our stuff on our computer, we save it as a file. Okay, and then we store those files in specific locations. So in most cases, we are storing our stuff in our hard disk or hard drive, or what's sometimes called the C drive. This is a large capacity storage device that's built into your computer, all right? It's considered permanent storage, all right? Things don't just, it doesn't just uh, delete things after a certain amount of time. Once you put it in there, it stays there forever until you decide to delete it, all right? So in most cases, this is where we're storing our stuff, in our hard drive. Um, it's also where, as I mentioned before, the computer needs specific files, um, system and program files, and uh, uh, excuse me, um, yes, it, excuse me, it needs specific programs and files to run itself. All right, things that you don't really use, but the computer, it, they're built into the computer, and those are also stored in the hard drive. Now, we also have other storage options. So we could use removable slash portable storage devices. And typically we're doing this to back up and or transport files. Okay, so for example, if you have a few very important files on your computer and you wanna save an extra copy somewhere else, just in case something happens to your computer, okay, that would be, a, that would be an example of backing up your file. Okay, sometimes we just wanna transport our files. We wanna be able to access our document or our pictures on another computer somewhere else. Maybe we're going to a family uh, member's house, a friend's house, the library. All right, in that case, that would be an example of transporting our files. All right, but really we could do both of those things at the same time, backup and transport. So some examples of removable and portable storage devices include CDs or DVDs. Okay, so for example, if you have audio files like songs on your computer, you might save those onto a CD so that you can then play them on a CD player. Okay, so you're essentially just copying the songs that are on your computer onto another device. So they're now saved and accessible in both places, in your hard drive and on a CD. Um, another good example is a flash drive, all right, which is what we see right here. All right, sometimes it's called a USB drive or a thumb drive. Uh, we typically, we plug this into the USB port on our computer and we could use that to um, store files, all right? And uh, flash drives really um, operate as both input and output. This is a great example of kind of going back and forth with our files, all right? So for example, if I have a file saved on my hard drive that I want to access at another location, let's say the library, I could copy, make a copy of that file onto a flash drive, unplug the flash drive, and then plug in that flash drive to another computer again, let's say at the library, and get access to that copy there. So it allows me to move files back and forth. I can also, uh, if let's say a friend 
puts a uh, file onto their flash drive, I can then plug it into my computer, copy it to my hard drive to save it for myself. So it, it acts as both an input and an output device. Let me just erase that drawing there. All right, there are all, you can also purchase an external hard drive, which is basically just another hard drive um, with, that, with that super large capacity, but it's stored and um, externally out of your computer and plugged into the USB port. All right. Um, typically, we don't need those too often, um, but it's it's a great tool to use if, let's say, you want to back up everything on your computer. Okay. Um, an external hard drive would definitely accomplish that goal because it has enough space to accommodate everything in your hard drive. Um, now, just one more storage option I want to touch on real quick because it's so popular nowadays. It's something called cloud storage. All right, or off-site storage. So this is storage that's available remotely from any computer with the internet. Okay, so um, common examples of this include Microsoft OneDrive. Okay, the icon for that is right here. Um, also iCloud and Google Drive. Excuse me one second while I just fix something on my end. All right, and I think I um, I apologize if I misspoke before. I I think I may have said that was Microsoft OneDrive. We're actually looking at iCloud there. So um, so again, uh, common examples of cloud storage include iCloud, Microsoft OneDrive. Google Drive, okay? Essentially, let's take the example of Google Drive. Um, what, what's happening is that Google is allowing you to store your information on one of their servers, okay? Basically, another way of saying one of their own computers. Um, so you, with as long as you have an internet connection, you can transport a file from your computer to a Google Drive account, okay? Just over the internet, or what we would say, what we would call uploading a file to Google Drive, okay? You could either copy it or just move it completely to your Google Drive account, all right? Um, these cloud storage plat uh, the, uh, programs are very popular now. These accounts are typically free up to a certain amount of space, all right? So they're great for transport. They're also great for backing up important files, all right? And in fact, it's so popular that um, some laptops now don't even have USB ports built in. Uh, because the assumption is that you're going to just use a cloud program like this to back up and transport your files rather than using a flash drive um, or something like that. Now, when we organize our files on our PC, all right, basically just picture a filing cabinet, okay? So anything we save is called a file. It's being saved as a file which is a collection of information with a unique name, and we store it on our computer or on some other disk, such as a flash drive maybe. Information or data can be stored, excuse me, they are stored in some type of file, and these files are then grouped into folders and subfolders. Okay, subfolders are basically just folders inside of other folders. And each file has a name and location, of course, so we can, so which identifies what the file is, so we could just look at it and say, oh, that's my resume, for example. And also so we can remember where, you know, what it's called so we can find it later. Okay, then we put it into a specific location. So, um, so the Windows operating system gives us a lot of flexibility in creating our own file management system. All right, we can create our own subfolders. We can be as specific as we need to be. We can put folders inside of folders inside of folders and just keep going. And then we can name our files whenever we need to name them and just place them accordingly. And we can move them around. If we change our minds, we can copy them, all sorts of things. Things that we cover in more detail in our next class, Windows 10 Essentials. Now, let's kind of jump back to those two categories we talked about at the very, at the very beginning, hardware and software. So um, how do we create files in the first place? Okay, usually we're doing that by using some type of software. Software are the set of instructions that control many basic functions of the computer. Okay, so most of us um, actually, well, uh, these instructions can range from just a few instructions to perform a single task 
to a much more complex instruction list, which may also include tables of data. So, you know, um, we as computer users, what are we usually using a computer for? Well, to perform a task or several tasks at the same time, browsing the internet, typing up a document, listening to music, or maybe downloading music, um, looking at pictures, editing pictures, maybe doing our taxes, all right, a whole, a whole number of things. So there are different programs designed for different tasks. And some of these are simpler and some of them are much more complex. All right, but they are all referred to as software. All right, so software is basically what you need in order to, to perform these basic functions. Now, we also have the operating system, which is kind of, think of it as almost hovering above your software and hardware resources. So the operating system is the master control program for the computer. It manages the hardware and software resources of a computer. It is the stored information that your computer needs to operate. Okay, actually let me, before I bring that up. So again, the operating system is basically what makes the computer user friendly. Okay, without it, um, it would be very hard to kind of make, find, locate different programs, use programs, etc. So it puts everything into a language we can understand and organizes everything to a system that's relatively easy to navigate. So the most popular operating system out there is the Windows operating system. And the, the specific version of Windows we'll be talking about today is Windows 10. Now there's also the Mac operating system, which is installed onto Mac computers, which in terms of file management especially, works very much the same way as Windows does. There's also um, a, an operating system called Linux, okay, um, which you won't really find on uh, home computers so much. Usually you see this in kind of bigger organizational settings. Also Android, all right, I should have Android on here and remind me to add that. Um, that's another example of an operating system that we typically see on um, uh, smartphones, right? So Windows, let's talk about Windows more specifically for one second, and then we're gonna jump into my Windows 10 operating system so we can look at it. So Microsoft Windows, it refers to a family of operating systems for personal computers. So it lets you give orders to your computer and the system then acts on your commands. So again, it allows you to just use the computer with relative ease. You say, I wanna open this file, I wanna open this program, the operating system will do that for you, okay, with the click of your mouse or by using your keyboard. It provides an interface which will be consistent from one program to another. So there's a reason it's called Windows. It's because um, as you're multitasking, all the different things you're looking at are organized and separated by, or excuse me, organized into and separated by different windows. So if you're browsing the internet, at the same time you're typing up a document, at the same time you're looking at a picture, saved on your computer, all right. Each of those three tasks is gonna be viewable in its own window. And then you can put a window away temporarily to just look at one, bring the other one back. So you can kind of uh, manage your windows as, as needed. Open them, close them, minimize them. So the idea is that um, no matter what program you're using, there will be some controls that are universal. So you don't have to relearn some of these controls depending on the program you're using. So it's consistent and universal, or in some cases, almost universal. And last but not least, uh, the desktop is the main display area of Windows 10, just like it has been with other Windows versions. All right, and Windows 10, again, like other Windows additions or versions, it offers the start menu, which contains links to every area of your computer. So as we're going to see, there are different areas of access, different places to go to access things on your computer, programs, files, and folders. The start menu and the desktop are basically those two main areas to access all of your stuff. Now, I'm gonna jump into my Windows 10 screen in one second. Before I do that, Let's talk about when we first turn on our PC. When you first hit that power button, okay, to turn on the PC, the power button, which is typically if you're on a desktop, it's gonna be on the CPU portion. 
um, our computer starts up. And the first thing we come to is not the desktop or the start menu, okay? It's the lock screen that looks like this, okay? Um, so the lock screen, basically it's an indication that your computer is currently locked, which is a great security feature, so nobody can just turn on your computer and get access to all your personal stuff. Once you advance, advance past this screen by clicking with your mouse or clicking any key on the keyboard, the next thing you see is the login screen. Okay, and this is where you put in your Windows username and your password, and then it logs you into your Windows account. So keep in mind, you could have, um, when you have your Windows 10 operating system, you can have multiple accounts on one computer so that you have your own account, um, your, your spouse or your, one of your kids or whomever has their own account, um, also, we see this in a workplace, right? We all, we, uh, you might share a computer with other colleagues, and each of you has your own Windows account. So you put in your username, you put in your password, and then it finally brings you into Windows 10. And typically, it's gonna. The first thing I'm gonna do is open up your Start menu automatically. All right. Um, it may not always do that, depending on your configurations. All right, and then. Behind the start menu is your desktop that looks like this. And that is where I'm going to leave us with this PowerPoint and bring us into my actual screen. So let me put this away and you will see something very similar right here. So what you were looking at right now is my screen on my computer, my Windows 10. Uh, right now it's my desktop, okay? Now keep in mind, you're gonna see a lot of icons on mine. Because uh, remember, um, all these things are customizable. You can do whatever you want. Basically, you can add files, folders, programs to your to your desktop area. So this is just how mine looks. All right, you may have more icons, you may have fewer. It all just depends on how your Windows account is configured. All right, but the area itself is the same. So we're looking at the desktop, and underneath the desktop that. That horizontal dark gray bar at the bottom is called the task bar. Okay, I'm kind of drawing a line above it, left to right. That's our task bar. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. Where I want to start is the start menu. So in the bottom left-hand corner of your desktop um, where uh, is your start menu icon or button, and that's where you go to launch the start menu. All right, it's been in the lower left-hand corner pretty much always until Windows 11. But let's not worry about that right now. In Windows 10 here, the Start menu icon is in the bottom left-hand corner. So we click on it, and it launches our Start menu like this. If we click on it again, the Start menu goes away. We can also open the Start menu using the Windows key on our keyboard. So if you look at your keyboard, you may have a Windows key. You may even have two Windows keys. Um, if you don't have one, that's okay. You might just have an older keyboard, that's fine. But if you look at your keyboard, locate your space bar. To the left of the space bar, uh, you might see a Windows key, that it's that Windows icon. You might even see one to the right of the space bar as well. So if you press a Windows key, that will also launch your start menu. If you press it again, it will close the start menu. All right, so let me open it back up again. And now we can talk about the start menu in more detail. All right, so the start menu, um, basically the name start menu says it all. It's a good place to start when you need to start, um, when you want to get, you know, get moving on your computer tasks or projects for that day. Because the start menu basically gives you links to everything in your computer. Now it's primarily set up to get, to give you access to software programs but you can get access to other things, including folders, okay, and the files inside of those folders, and also some of the kind of, um, uh, basically our Windows 10 settings, okay, things that are kind of in the background that allow us to customize our Windows account. All right, but first let's talk about the software program. So, the Start menu in Windows 10 is basically divided into two halves, a left half here, You'll see that big list, and on the right, and then we have this right half with these big tiles. All right, they look like kind of just big buttons. Let's talk about the left half first. So, the left side is your apps list. Okay, it's going to show you 
all of the apps or programs, software programs that are currently installed on your computer. So again, your list is um, most definitely going to look different than mine. That's because we have different programs installed on our computers. So um, if you bring your mouse pointer to the right of that list, before you hit that tile area, you will see a scroll bar pop up, okay? Um, that's because the scroll bars in Windows 10 are set up to hide automatically. All right, but once it pops up, I can click and drag and I can scroll down this list and you'll see it's all arranged alphabetically, A to Z, or in my case, A to Y, because I don't have any programs that start with a Z. Now, uh, let, me, let me scroll back up here. I'm just going to kind of keep scrolling up and down periodically. So as I scroll back up, so you'll see that many of these programs have the program icon next to them. All right, basically it's just their logo for that specific program. When you see that program icon, that means that that listing or that entry, that is the access point to that program. So if I give it one single click, I'll, let me use calculator as an example. If I give it one single click, it's going to just launch the calculator program. And there it is. Let me just close it now and go back to the start menu. That was just a quick example. All right, so when you see the program icon, that is the access point to that program. One single click will open it up. Now, there are some others, however, some other entries that have folder icons. Let me use the example of Windows accessories down toward the bottom. All right, um, real quick, if you need to zoom in on my screen on what I'm doing, go to meeting. The program we're using for this class does have a zoom feature. If you bring your mouse pointer to the right, you will see a plus sign and a minus sign pop up. Plus sign zooms in, minus sign zooms out. Just keep in mind that if you do zoom in onto my screen, uh, you will likely not see my entire screen anymore, but you can click and drag with your mouse to move around. All right, let's go back to the start menu. So as I mentioned, some of these entries have folder icons next to them, such as Windows Accessories here. When they have the folder icon, you'll also see to the right a drop down arrow. That indicates a drop down menu. So the folder icon means that this, this particular entry is grouping together a number of related things. So if I click on Windows Accessories, it's not going to open anything. It's just going to open that folder. As you can see here, now I have a drop down menu of, in this case, several different apps or programs, starting with 3D Builder down to WordPad. Okay, so in this case, this Windows Accessories folder is just grouping together related programs. Windows Accessories are, uh, are basically, a lot of these are, for one thing, they're built into Windows. So these just come with the Windows 10 operating system. I didn't install these myself. There are, a lot of them are also kind of legacy programs that have been around forever, and they're still available with Windows, such as Paint, Notepad, WordPad. Okay, so that's how these are related in this case. Now, if I click on Windows Accessories again, it's just going to close the folder. So you can open the folder and close the folder as needed. Open, close. All right, now let me do one more example. Let me go up to iTunes. All right, the iTunes also has a folder icon. In this case, it only has, the drop-down menu only has two options or two entries, okay? About iTunes and iTunes. The second one, iTunes, has the program icon, which means that that is the access point to the iTunes program. The one above it, however, the icon is a dog-eared piece of paper. Okay, you might be familiar with this, you might not. Whenever you see a dog-eared piece of paper icon in Windows, that indicates a file. So this is an about iTunes file that uh, presumably has some supporting documentation for the iTunes program. All right, so maybe some help and guidance features, things like that, technical specifications. So, and again, if I click on the iTunes folder, I'll close it back up. So. All this is to say, when you see the folder icon in your start menu, in your apps list, 
All right, it just means that it's grouping together related items, whether they're all different programs or whether they're a program and then supporting documentation. Okay, otherwise, when you just see the logo or the, the program icon, that is the access point to that program. You give it one single click and you open up the program. Now, let's go to the right for a minute. On the right side, we have these, what look like big tiles, okay? And we'll just call this the tile area. It's, it's um, Windows basically just, it still calls this the start menu, okay? Because it is in the start menu, but this specific section, we'll call it the tile area, just to be clear. So um, Microsoft and Windows, okay, they love to give you multiple ways to access one thing. Okay, so if you have a, a program that you use every day, let's say Google Chrome to browse the internet or Microsoft Edge to browse the internet, you might wanna have multiple access points to that program so you can get to it faster. All right, so that's um, what this tile area does. It's a quick access area for your favorite programs. Okay, and basically what we do is when we add an access point to a program in our tile area, we are pinning that program to the start menu. So uh, that's P-I-N, like pinning. Okay, so if, almost like if you picture a bulletin board at home and you're pinning a note to it, same idea. Um, whenever you see the term pin in, in Windows, okay, or another Microsoft program, it basically just means adding an access point to that thing, whether it's a program, a file, or a folder, okay? So in this case, we can pin our favorite apps from this main list to the tile area here for quicker access. So again, I'll say that one more time. We can pin a program as a tile to our start menu for quicker access. So for example, on mine, you'll see Microsoft Word right here at the top. So that's available in my main list under uh, Word here, but it's also available as a pinned tile in my start menu here. So I have two access points to the same program. Either way, if I give it one single click, it will launch the Microsoft Word program. And in Windows Essentials next week, we'll talk in more detail about how we pin things and customize our areas of access. And again, if you're if you have a different arrangement of tiles and if you have different programs pinned to your tile area, don't worry. That's just how your account is configured because this is all customizable. Now let's go to the left side of the start menu because aside from our software programs, we also have access to a few other things from our start menu. And those other things, okay. Those are on the very left side. So if I bring my mouse pointer over to the left, you'll see a set of icons in the bottom left corner. Now, if I just point at any of those icons, that left side will expand and show me the full labels for each icon, like this. So again, I brought my mouse pointer to the left of the start menu, and I'm gonna point at any of those icons. I'll just point at the top one, and then that left side will expand to show me what those icons are or what they give me access to. All right, so again, you you will likely have different um, icons and access points in um, on your start menu here. Don't worry about that because again, it's customizable. This is just how mine looks based on what I've done to my operating system. So the first icon, which you will have, okay, this is your profile icon. It's gonna say your Windows account name. If you click on this, you'll get a few options. First is change account settings. This will link you to your Windows 10 settings where you can do things like add a profile picture that shows up on the login screen. Um, you can uh, set up more security features. So instead of just putting in a password to log in, you could set up a PIN number in addition to um, a password, things like that. So you can add security features to your account. 
Um, you could, it gives you links to family account settings, all right? Um, and also to sync devices. If you're not familiar with syncing, in fact, let me just click on this. You'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about here. So this is gonna take me directly to my account settings for my Windows account. Notice how it says your info right here. Okay, so as I said, on the left side, we have signed in options. So I can add additional sign in options, basically to beef up the security on login. All right, um, but at the bottom, I just wanna point out sync your settings. All right, so if you're not familiar with syncing, which is um, very popular nowadays, we see this term all the time. Um, syncing will, if you have multiple devices that are using the same Windows account, all right, let's say you have a desktop, you also have a laptop. Both computers are using the same Windows account. All right, you can sync your settings to both devices so that however it looks on your desktop, it also looks like that on your laptop, okay? Um, you just have to, you basically have to turn sync settings on here and sign into your Microsoft account. All right, all these, all the syncing features are done through your, to your online Microsoft account, which is free to create. You just have to um, assign it an email address and a, and set up a password, and that's really it. Okay, and you and you should see a link to that here if you don't have it set up already to your Microsoft account. Now let me just close this and go back to the Start menu. All right, also available in that profile icon, we have the lock and sign out options. All right, um, if you lock your computer, it's gonna just bring it back to that lock screen that you first see when you turn it on. So if you're going, let's say you're gonna walk away from your computer for 10, 15 minutes. All right, so you're gonna be absent. You don't want anybody to have access to your computer in the meantime, because you're not there. You can just temporarily lock it, all right? And then when you come back, you'll just have to put in your password again, and you'll be right back to where you left off. So if you were typing up a document, Let's say, okay, you don't have to necessarily save the document and close the program. You could just leave it, lock your computer, put in your password again, and it will everything will still be there when you return. Okay, it's just a, it basically just is a way of temporarily locking the computer so that other people can get access to it. All right, now the next one is sign out. This will sign you out of your Windows account altogether. Okay, so if, let's say you share a computer with somebody, whether it's at home or at work, and they want to get into their Windows account now, you don't have to turn off the computer and restart it. You can just sign out of your account and then they could just then sign into theirs. And you do that by just clicking on sign out and then they and then you just switch accounts basically. Just keep in mind, if you do sign out, you will lose any information that wasn't saved, most likely, okay? So unlike lock where everything will still be there when you return, if you sign out, you want to make sure that you save your work. And if you're looking at a website that you want to come back to, make sure maybe you save it to your favorites in your web browser, things like that. Just so when you return to your Windows account, you can get access to those things again. You don't lose anything that you wanted saved. Okay, now um, I'm going to skip over these next two documents and pictures. I'm going to come back to those. Let's go to settings, okay? Um, this this is an access point to your Windows 10 settings, which I just kind of showed you before with the profile, okay, the your info section we were in. So let me click on this real quick just so you can see what it looks like. All right. Um, so in Windows 10, this is your this is what your Windows settings portal looks like. Earlier versions of Windows used to use something called Control Panel, which is basically where you went to adjust all of your different settings. Okay, um, uh, hooking up to a, maybe a, a Wi-Fi access point. Okay, um, adding a new device like a printer or a mouse, something like that. All right, going to your security settings, changing your desktop background, all those kinds of things were essentially done in the Control Panel. Uh, what they've done now with more recent editions of Windows, they've optimized it a bit. So it doesn't look quite as, it, it, the, the old control panel looked a little bit basic or um, kind of rudimentary, okay? 
So they've kind of optimized the look and made it a bit easier to use. So that's what we're looking at here, the Windows 10 settings portal. You'll see that all your different settings are organized by these different categories, such as system, devices, phone, network, and internet personalization. Okay, and then there are others as you can see. And when you click on a section here, I'll use system as an example, that section will be further broken down your system into more specific categories like display, sound, notifications and actions, etc. And when you click on one of those categories, you'll make your adjustments or configurations on the right here. All right, very simple to use. It, it, very simple to navigate. Let me go back to the main home page here. And you'll also notice there is a find or a search tool here. So if you're not sure where a specific setting is located, you can just type it in. So for example, I'll type in mouse and you'll get a drop down of different specific settings for the mouse. And you can just click on it, it will take you right to those settings. So you don't have to, so you don't have to, you know, waste time browsing through all these categories looking for it. Now at the moment, I'm not concerned with Windows 10 settings. I just wanted to show you where it is and what it looks like. So I'm gonna to go to the upper right hand corner, click on the X to close it. Let me go back to the start menu, back to the very left side. And the last icon at the bottom is the power button. All right, if I click on this, again, I'll get three options. Sleep, shut down, and restart. All right. So sleep uh, puts your computer into a, uh, basically like a, a low energy state. All right, so again, kind of like locking it. If you're gonna be away from the computer for uh, an, a, an extended period of time, but you wanna come back to it to, to work on the same stuff, you could put it into sleep mode so that it's using less power. All right, so you're not draining the energy and the electricity for nothing. Um, so typically your monitor will power down Okay, and basically your computer itself is just pausing. That's that's essentially what it's doing. If you hear it running right now, okay, you hear that drive running, it's just gonna pause and almost sound like it's turned off. And then when you return, you wake it up and you can configure it so you have to put in your password again. So you can, so you, or set, uh, you can kind of combine sleep with lock and then you'll be back to what you were working on before. Um, the next one down is shut down. This is where you go to shut down your computer when you're completely done with it. Okay, so uh, you're done for the day. Okay, you close all of your programs, save your work, and then you shut down your computer. All right, and that's typically the order in which you want to do things before you shut down. In fact, if you point at shut down, it says close all apps and turns off the PC. So the first, before you shut down, before you shut down your computer completely, you always want to save your work. And then close your apps. Now, if you click on shutdown, it's going to close the apps automatically for you. But I find that if you do this yourself manually ahead of time, it kind of speeds things up. So just close any programs that are running and then finally click on shutdown. Last but not least is restart. Uh, restarting, just as it says, it will shut down your computer, but then automatically restart it by itself. We typically have to do this when we install new updates or maybe new programs, okay? They need the computer to restart to take effect. So if you need to do it yourself manually, that's this is where you would go to restart the computer. All right, now let's return to those other two um, icons here that I did not address, documents and pictures. So as you can see, the start menu is really, the start menu is primarily devised to give you access to software programs. and um, and some of your settings, but you can get access to files and folders. All right, and this is just one place to do that. So this is kind of a quick access area to get to your files and folders. So, um, so when you have a Windows operating system, Windows gives you a set of default folders, or we can call them main folders. All right, these are folders that you did not create. Windows, they just come pre-installed or pre-loaded with Windows. And you may have seen these before, your documents folder, your pictures folder. Those are two examples of default folders that come with Windows. 
the idea is that you use your documents folder, for example, to then organize more specific subfolders. So I might use the Windows Documents folder. And in that folder, I'll create a resume subfolder. I'll create a cover letters subfolder. I'll create a um, uh, flyers subfolder if I'm creating flyers for my business, things like that. So these are default folders that come with Windows that just give you a place to start in terms of file and folder management. So if I, for example, click on the documents icon, it's going to open up my documents folder here. Now we're going to come back to files and folders in a little bit, so I won't go into too much detail here. So in fact, I'll close this, but I'm just showing you that that's what those icons are doing. They're giving you quick access to some of your main default Windows folders. All right, you can add more default folders to this list. You can also take these away if you don't want them there. Something we'll cover next week in Windows 10 Essentials. All right, actually, then let me just open it up one more time because I just want to reiterate that these are default Windows folders. They come with Windows. So some of your other, your other default folders that will already be installed are your desktop folder, documents, downloads, music, and pictures. Oh, and videos. I almost skipped that one. All right, so those are folders that came with, with this Windows 10 operating system, and then I can add more folders into those as needed. All right, I'm powering down my webcam for just one second while I get a sip of water, and I'll be right there. All right, um, so at this point, we've pretty much addressed everything in the start menu. All right, our different, um, we have our, again, we have our apps list. We have our tile area where we, where we can pin our favorite apps as tiles to get to them faster. And then on the left side, some of those more, we'll call these kind of system controls, all right? Our, um, our, our uh, profile or Windows account, our power button, and then access to the default folders and our Windows 10 settings. Okay, and settings, by the way, is another one you, you might not have on your left side, because um, this is another one that you can add or take away. Okay, but you will most certainly have your profile icon and your power icon. Now, let's leave the start menu and talk about the desktop and taskbar. So to close the start menu, you can click on the icon again at the bottom left corner. You can press the Windows key on your keyboard or perhaps even faster, just click anywhere outside of the start menu with your mouse and it will close. All right, now we're looking at the desktop, which is kind of the main work area in Windows. Before we talk about the main desktop area, I wanna talk about the taskbar at the bottom. So. At the bottom of the screen, going left to right, we have that horizontal bar. It's kind of a dark gray color, almost black. That's our task bar. All right, I'll kind of draw an arrow there for a second. Forgive me if the arrow is not perfectly straight. All right, so under that arrow, left to right, that's our task bar. And this is essentially just another quick access area to our favorite programs. So it's kind of like the tiles area in our start menu. All right, it serves, it serves the same purpose. It gives us quick access to our favorite programs. So we can pin our favorite programs to the start menu as tiles. We can also pin our favorite programs to the taskbar. All right, same process. Again, we'll talk about that next week in Windows 10 Essentials. All right, so that's just one purpose for the taskbar. It gives you quick access to your favorite programs. All right, one single click will launch that program. Now, uh, the taskbar also does a few other things. It is also the kind of main control center for your open and, re and minimized windows. All right, so if I am running a program, in fact, if you look at PowerPoint here, draw an arrow there, 
okay? Under that, it's kind of hard to see, but under that P, that icon, there is kind of a, a, a white, almost bluish white line, okay? That indicates that that program is currently running. And if I click on the icon, it's gonna open something up, okay? Some kind of, um, some PowerPoint presentation that is, I'm working on, or it might be more than one, okay? In fact, if I point at it, I see that there are two running at the same time. So we'll come back to this again in a little bit, but these, um, your taskbar also shows you what programs are currently running and allows you to basically manage the windows, okay? Put one away, put, make one full screen, look at two simultaneously, okay, all kind of things like that we can manage with our taskbar. Now also in the taskbar, you have your search tool on the left, which allows you to search for specific things on your computer. So if you forget where you put a specific file, you don't remember what folder it's in, you could just search for it by name there. Okay. I'm, I'm, let me, I'm clicking into the search bar. So you can look for, um, it's kind of, I, unfortunately I can't circle this, but at the top here, you'll see that all is selected, but you can narrow down your search by different apps, different documents or files, not just text-based documents, any file. Uh, you can also search the web. So you can actually, even from here, as long as you have internet access, you can search the web for information right from your start, uh, from your taskbar, excuse me. And you can also limit it to emails, folders, music, et cetera. All right, let me close that. All right, next to the search, this icon here is task view. Okay. Um, if you're not familiar with task view, All right, um, at the top left of the screen, you should see an, a little uh, an icon with a plus sign that says new desktop. All right, so um, task view allows you to actually create more virtual desktops. Um, so if you're not changing anything about what's stored in the computer or anything like that, it's basically just, again, if you think about Windows here, um, whenever I'm working on, let's say I'm, let's say I am listening to music, while at the same time I'm working on an essay or some kind of project in Microsoft Word, just to kind of um, to separate my different activities. Okay, it might be easier if I have my music player open in in a specific desktop separate from this one. That way I can toggle back and forth as needed. So I'm not crowding the screen with my music player, okay, it's only, all I'm doing is using my is using Microsoft Word. And then in desktop number two, I have the program that's playing my music. So occasionally I can go to that music player in that desktop to change the, the song, change the, you know, change the album, whatever it is, change the station. All right, so we can actually, it kind of allows us to multitask. We can separate our work into different desktops by going to task view, and clicking on new desktop. All right, last but not least in your taskbar to the right, where I am, oops, if I can get there, where I am drawing with that red pen. All right, that's called your system tray, system tray. Um, the system tray is essentially a quick access area for specific settings. Okay, so so again, think of your the tile area in the in the in the start menu and the taskbar here gives us quick access to programs. The system tray is kind of a quick access area to settings, things like your Wi-Fi, time and date, all right, um, maybe security settings, things like that. So it's kind of a, a quick way to get to those specific settings. Those are here in the system tray, and if you see an up arrow on yours. All right, that will open up additional um, uh, access points to other things. Typically, um, oftentimes we see background apps as well in our system tray. Um, if you're not familiar, so some apps uh, are basically always running in the background, so they open up faster. All right, so if you see any apps icons in your system tray, 
it's because they're kind of they are, they're essentially running in the background without you actually opening them. All right, now above the taskbar, we have the main desktop area. And this has been around with Windows forever, okay, or desktop. Again, another quick access area. All right, we can add access points to several things here. Programs, just like our start menu and taskbar, but we can also add access points to files and folders. And typically when we're adding an access point to our main desktop area, we're creating what's called a shortcut, okay? So this is different than pinning something like we discussed with the start menu and the taskbar. When we're talking about the main desktop area here, okay, when we create an access point, we are creating a shortcut. So when you see an icon such as this one here, in fact, let me make it bigger for a second. Okay, this one here, when you see an icon under Windows 10 desktop that has this arrow in the bottom left corner, that indicates a shortcut. That is just an access point to that particular program, file, or folder. Okay, here's an example right here of a shortcut to a file. There is the dog-eared piece of paper is, is the icon, and there's the shortcut arrow in the bottom left corner. All right, so these are just quick access points to these particular things. Again, we'll talk about that in more detail next week in Windows 10 Essentials. We'll talk about creating them. Well, we'll basically, we'll talk more detail about what a shortcut is and how we can create them and if we need to remove them. All right, but just remember that adding a shortcut to your desktop is, is a different process than pinning an access point to your start menu or to your desktop. All right, let me just put this back to the normal view. Oops. Perfect. All right, and things saved to your desktop, by the way, are launched with a double click as opposed to a single click like we saw with the start menu and the taskbar. All right, so now what I'd like to talk about is when we do open up a program, all right, I just want to talk, I don't, I don't want to talk about any specific program, um, but I do want to talk about kind of what we, uh, some of the controls we see when we open up a program, no matter what program it is. All right, we'll also talk, and this will kind of also work into a discussion on saving our work and organizing it in our operating system. So, I'm going to use Microsoft Word as an example here. All right. So at this point, we talked about all these different areas of access, how we get to different things, what kind of things we find in those areas. So now we're going to talk about what happens when we open basically one of those things up. In this case, we're talking about programs, not files and folders yet. So I'm going to use Microsoft Word as an example. I'm going to click it in my taskbar and, and launch this program. Now remember, we're not talking about Word in detail here. If you want to learn more about Microsoft Word, I do have a class tomorrow um, specifically about Microsoft Word or Word One class if you want to learn more. Right now, this is just for um, demonstration purposes. So I'm going to open up a document and I'm just going to create a file real quick. So I'm just going to type in here, um, I'm just trying to think of a good, uh, what can I call this? Let's just call it, we're going to title this. Um, I'm going to put in Windows. Basics practice one. Okay. Windows basics practice one. So we're just pretending that I just created a file. And in a minute, we'll talk about saving it, like I said, and organizing it in our folders. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to create another document. 
or another file. Okay, and when you're using Windows, remember documents or files, those two terms, basically they can be used interchangeably. Okay, this one's going to be called Windows Basics Practice 2. Now, let me make it bigger so we can see each better as we go through. Good. In fact, we'll even do this just, just to more easily differentiate the two as I kind of toggle back and forth here. All right, that works. So first of all, as you can see, when we're using Windows, we can multitask. First of all, we can have several programs open at the same time. We can also have different, we can also be creating multiple files in one program at the same time, which is what we're doing here with Microsoft Word. So I'm using Microsoft Word, and at the same time, I'm working on two different documents. Windows Basics Practice 1 here, and Windows Basics Practice 2 here. All right, now, so essentially what this means is I need to be able to multitask easily. I need to be able to kind of put something away so I can work on just one thing at a time, which is which is likely how I'll be doing this. You can work on two things or two or more things at the same time, which basically means they can all share the screen together. Uh, but usually, I would say most cases, we're trying to just do focus on one thing at a time. So let me bring Windows Basics Practice 1 up uh, back up here. So we're looking at 1. So in order to do that, Windows provides you with Windows display controls at the top right corner of any window, no matter what program you're using. OK, I, I circled it up there. It might be a bit hard to see. All right, but those are our Windows display controls. So remember at the beginning of class, I talked about that consistent interface from one program to another. This is what I was getting at. So um, we have those Windows display controls. And whenever you're using a, 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 a program in Windows, by the way, typically when you point at any icon or um, you know, tool, anything, when you point at it, you'll typically get a little tag telling you what that thing does, what it is and what it does. So if you're ever unsure, just point at it and it will tell you. This is, again, not just Microsoft Word, really any program that you're using in Windows. So um, let's go back to the top right. So these are our window display controls. So the very first one we see is that minus sign or that dash, right? That's minimize. So if I minimize this window for Windows Basics Practice 1, what's it going to do? It's going to put it away. But underneath of it is still the other file I'm working on, Windows Basics Practice 2. If I minimize this one, now I'm just back to my desktop. So we didn't close the files or the program that they were open in. We just put the we just put those two projects or files away temporarily. So when we're using Windows like this, remember, whatever tasks we're working on, each task has its own window and the windows are layered on top of one another. Okay, so as we minimize, we might be, there's probably gonna be another window behind that one. We minimize it, there might be another one. We keep going until eventually, if we minimize all of them, we're looking at our desktop again. So this tells me that anything I'm working on, all of their respective windows are currently minimized. Okay, now, if I look down at my taskbar, remember that's where we go to kind of control the, um, whether a window's open or, or Minim or minimized. Okay, if I point at the word icon, first of all, notice the bluish white line under the word icon. I pointed that out before. That tells me that the program is running. If I point at the icon in my taskbar, you will see these two thumbnails pop up, two thumbnail images. All right, right now it's calling them document one and document two. We're going to fix that in a little bit. But let's just look at this first. So we have two thumbnails side by side, document one, document two. So these are the two documents I'm working on at the same time in the Microsoft Word program. Okay, now if I wanna bring one of them back full screen, all right, so from completely minimized to, com to complete full screen, all I have to do is click on it. In fact, before I even click on it, I'll show you that if I point, if I just point at one of these like this, it will give me a preview, a full screen preview of that file. If I point away from it, 
it goes back to just the minimized state. Okay, it's not opening it, it's just giving me a full screen preview. But if I click on it, which I'll do right now, now I am indeed back to full screen. So now I can begin working on this document again. Now, if I wanna bring Windows Basics Practice 2 to full screen, same process, I just go down to the Word icon and I click on the thumbnail for that file and there it is. So now they're both full screen. Practice 2 is currently layered on top of Practice 1. All right, now, um, so right now we're looking at two, Windows Basic Practice 2, that's okay, we'll just leave it right there. Now, back to those Windows display controls in the upper right corner. The next one is called Restore Down. It looks like two windows in front and back of each other. All right, this will temporarily just reduce the size of the window, or as it says, restore it down. So if I click on this for the Practice 2 file, you can see that this particular window is currently in a reduced size or reduced state. Practice 1 is still full screen behind it. That's still in full screen. There it is. And as you can see right now, when a window is restored down like this, you can move it around. So if you go to what's called the title bar, which is the top of the window, if you click and drag with your mouse, click, hold, and drag, you can put it in a, put it in a different location. And once you have it where you once you have it in your desired location, you just let go or drop it, and there it is. Okay, now let me also restore down practice one here. And now we see both. All right, and typically if you have two or more uh, files running in the same program, it will Windows will cascade them if they're if they're if you know if one or more are restored down. So notice how they're kind of document two's up here and document one's here. They're kind of almost like tabbed, right? If we were looking at them in a filing cabinet, that's what it will do. So you can kind of get to them as needed. Now, if they're restored down, uh, keep in mind if they're restored down, I could still work on them in that in that reduced state. So if you look at Windows Basics Practice 1 right now, even though it's minim it's uh, reduced, I can still just keep typing and work on it like this. All right, so keeping that in mind, um, when we are trying to multitask, and if we want to work on more than one thing at the same time, Windows comes with a function called snapping, S-N-A-P, snap, all right? Um, there's a couple of different ways to do this, but the fastest way to snap um, is to just click, hold, and drag your window to a specific location. So if I want to look at two files at the same time, taking up two equal halves of the screen, I can click, hold, and drag the window to the center of one side. And I'll do that right now. So I'm looking at Windows Basics Practice 1. If I click, hold, and drag this and bring my mouse pointer to roughly the center of the left side of the screen all the way till you can't even see it anymore. Or I, I'm sorry, in this case, I still see it, but all the way to the edge. And I let go. Now it's taking up one half of the screen. Exactly. Now it's going to show you your other windows that are open. Okay. So now I decide what is the other window or what is the other file that I want to be working on at the same time? So all I have to do is click on it. Now it's taking up the other half. So remember, if you have more than one window restored down, okay, or I, I should say if you have any windows restored down, if you click and hold and drag and move it to the center of any side, left or right, that will snap it into place as one half of the screen. And then you could select another window to work on simultaneously, and that will take up the other half of the screen. Okay, you can also do the same thing uh, by dividing into four equal quadrants, a top left, a top right, a bottom left, a bottom right. So in other words, instead of two files, you can work on four. And it's the same process, it's, but instead of going to the center of the side, you go to the, to the corner of the screen. All right, so for example, 
In fact, let me bring these back to full screen for now. And I'll do it again. So if I restore down Windows Basic Practice 1 here, and I bring it, let's say, to the top left corner of the screen like this, so my mouse pointer is going to the top corner and touching it. Okay, now it's taking up one quarter of the screen. Actually, let me try that again. Okay, good. And now I can grab another window, bring this one to maybe the top right corner. And if I had two more, I could put those in the other corners. Okay, and depending on how it's, how your windows are currently displayed, you might be able to just select them with a click. If not, you just have to manually click and drag and put them into place. So now I have four different windows taking up four equal parts of the screen. And I can work on them all if I need to at the same time. Okay, this is also good though for comparing and contrasting. Maybe you're looking at um, an essay, all right, the sort of rough draft, and on the right side you're looking at the revised version to make to compare the two, you know, the changes, something like that. So it's not necessarily just for working on it in real time. It might just be to view them so you can see the differences. Or maybe you want to have your uh, a website open on one side with a recipe and on the other side a Word document where you're typing in the recipe. Okay, so it's also just for viewing as well. Now to kind of get out of this um, snapped view, I'm just gonna use the minimize icons in the respective windows to put them away. And now I have the two documents open, practice one, practice two. I'll put them both back to full screen here. All right, one second, I'm gonna get a sip of water and we'll, we'll be right back. All right, so, um, so as you can see, in terms of managing the displays of your windows, okay, what you're looking at full screen, what you're, what you're working on simultaneously, multitasking, things like that, um, these window display controls you'll find in all different programs you're running in Windows, no matter what program it is, okay? Um, um, and I didn't, the only thing I did touch on, of course, was the X, the last control in the top right corner. That's, of course, where you go to close the file and or the program all together when you're done. So if you have more than one file running in one program, like I do right now with Word, if I click the X, it's only going to close practice one. Practice two will still be available. If I then click the X in practice two, that will close that file and the Word program at the same time, because at that point there are no more files running, so the program just shuts down. All right, now before I do that though, I should probably save my work. So now let's talk about saving which is kind of another way that's done, uh, another process that's done somewhat universally, okay, no matter what program you're using. So if you're using a program that allows you to save your work, you will almost always see a file menu, okay? So we're looking at this, um, I'm looking at the Windows Basics Practice 1 file. In the top left corner of the Word screen, I see file here, I'm gonna click on it. Now, Again, programs that allow you to save work, typically they also allow you to start new projects or new files. They also allow you to open existing files that use that program, all right? And all those, and also to print your work. I should mention that too. So those four basic functions, creating new uh, files, opening existing files, saving your current file, and printing your current file, those four basic functions are um, very often found in a file menu, 
regardless of the program you're using. Sometimes it might just be the logo for the program and that acts as their file menu. But again, if, if it gives you those options, new, open, save, print, you'll typically find them all in the same menu. Okay. So um, I open the file menu and we see save and save as here. All right. So uh, because this is the first time I'm saving this, it's going to be a save as. Because that means I'm saving it as uh, this file in this specific folder under this name. I need to establish all of that criteria. But even if I click on save, it's okay. It's still going to take me to the save as screen anyway, like you see here. Now, keep in mind, as I just mentioned, the save process right now in Microsoft Word, it looks like this. Okay, this is specific to Word and other Office programs. It might not look like exactly like this in other types of programs, but the process itself is generally the same. You go to save, and then you decide where you're going to save it. So in the case of Word here, I see this PC, so I'll click on it. So that means I'm saving it on my computer. Okay, I'm not saving it to my OneDrive account, which is cloud storage. I'm saving it on my computer. So I selected this PC and then I'll click on browse with the folder icon to browse the folders in my computer and select the location for it. All right, now, and again, th this is what I'm saying, no matter what program you're using, when you go to save, it will either open up your folders like this, like we see right here automatically, so you can decide where you want to save it, or you might see some kind of browse button to first click that, and then it takes you to this window here. All right, so this is our save as dialog box. And basically this is where you go to assign or uh, this particular file a specific folder. Okay, um, and we'll look at this again, uh, something very similar to this again, when we talk about retrieving the file later. But this is what the save as dialog box looks like. Um, I won't go into too much detail. We'll talk about this in more uh, in more detail next week. But basically, we have a left navigation pane here, which is one place we can go to to um, select a specific folder and or a subfolder. Okay, into which we save this file. Okay, we could also kind of use this main section here to select the folder as well. So these two, the left navigation pane and this main screen kind of work hand in hand. Again, we'll talk about it in more detail next week. I don't want to throw too much information at you right now. Uh, but what I really just want to get at is the fundamentals or the basics of just saving a file and then finding it later. So in the Save As dialog box, I would select, the first thing I would do is select the folder that I want to save this file in. And typically that's something that's intuitive or that makes sense, right? If you have a resume, you're not going to put it into your pictures folder, most likely. You're, going to, you're probably going to put it in your documents folder. And more specifically, you may have created your own resumes subfolder. So you would probably save that resume in your resumes subfolder, which is inside of the main documents folder. All right, so that's what we're doing here. We're selecting a folder first. Okay, a folder that makes sense. So right now I'm looking inside of my main Windows Documents folder. How do I know? Because this is called the file path up here. And it tells me that I'm inside of my computer. And more specifically, I'm inside of the main Windows Documents folder. So this down here, this is showing me specific uh, subfolders that are located inside of the main documents folder. All right, now if I, I have this subfolder called class samples, so I wanna put it in there. So if I double click and open that up, look at my file path, now I'm inside of the class samples subfolder. All right, I was, before I was inside the documents folder, now I'm inside of the more specific class sample subfolder. So the last thing listed in your file path, that's the folder you're looking inside of right now. Okay, so um, after I've, now that I've selected a folder, I go down to file name to give this a more unique name. So we should always, um, 
depending on, on when you're saving your file, it might give it a generic name like document one, which of course you don't want to save it under that because you'll never know what it is and you'll never remember, um, you may not remember that specific name, right? We, we want to give it a name that's unique, something that tells us about what the file is, what it contains. So it's automatically filling in Windows Basics Practice 1 there. It's doing that because I typed that into the document already. Okay, that's just something that Word does, but I can still change it. So to change your file name, whether it's something generic or something like this, we could just erase it like so and call it something else. All right, so I'm going to just, I'm going to shorten it to WB Practice 1. WB Practice 1. Windows Basics Practice 1. And then I'm just going to click Save down at the bottom right, and now it's saved. So again, that process is pretty much the same no matter what program you're using in Windows. You go to the Save tool in its menu, whether it's a file menu or something similar to a file menu. You, you select the folder, you give it a name, and then you click Save. All right. So now I can close this file safely. So I'll click the X here in the upper right hand corner. I still have Windows Basics Practice 2. So let me do this again for this file. I'll go to file the file menu. I'll go to Save As. I'll select this PC and then click Browse. All right. And other programs, by the way, you won't necessarily have to worry about the this PC part. This is a Microsoft program, so it's linked to my Microsoft OneDrive account. That's why I get that option. Other programs, probably you'll, you won't have to worry about that. You'll just go to save and then just go to your folders, okay, and, and select the folder. So now we're back to the save as dialog box. Once again, it put us into our main Windows documents folder. I want to put it into the more specific subfolder called class sample, so I'm going to double click it to open it. Now I'm inside of that folder, so now I'll go down to file name. I'm going to change the name to WB Practice 2, and then I'll click Save. Now I can go to the upper hand corner, click on the X, which will close not just this file, but the entire Word program, because this is the only file that's currently running in the program. So now everything's shut down. And if you look at the Word icon on my taskbar, you will notice Okay, there's no under, it's not underlined, indicating that the program is in fact closed. Now, how do I get back to those files and folders? A few ways. Well, first of all, we can go back to our start menu. Remember your quick access to our documents folder here. Okay, because that's where the class samples folder is located inside of, right? Um, but if, if you want to get to all the folders in your computer, your main access point to all the folders in your PC is in your File Explorer app, okay? If you look at my taskbar, there's this icon that looks like a folder right here, and that's File Explorer, okay? Um, earlier versions of Windows called this Windows Explorer. Now it's called File Explorer. If you don't have an access point to File Explorer in your taskbar, click on your... Um, you can do a couple things. You can actually right click on the start menu icon itself, which will give you a menu like this. Okay, we'll talk about right clicking more next week, but just so you know, if you right click on the start menu icon, you will see access to, first of all, your settings, which you talked about earlier, but also File Explorer right here. You can also get the File Explorer by opening up the main start menu with a left click going down to Windows System, opening up that folder, and there's File Explorer right there. So no matter what access point you're using, it doesn't matter. It's gonna open up the same program, which is this right here. Let me make it full screen. So this is File Explorer, and this gives us access to all the folders in our computer, and not just our computer, um, if, again, not to get into too much detail, if you have a Microsoft OneDrive account, which is cloud storage, okay, remote storage available through an internet connection, you can actually sync it to your file explorer. So you can get access to it right here. It says OneDrive, okay? Also, if you have a, um, an external storage device plugged in, let's say you have a flash drive plugged into your computer, you would see that 
as an entry down here somewhere. Okay, but for now, we're just looking inside our actual hard drive. So let me just collapse this for a second. So again, we're going to go into more detail about File Explorer next week. But we see on the left side that same left navigation pane we saw with the Save As dialog box. So the Save As dialog box we looked at before where we saved our file, you'll notice that it looks pretty much the same as File Explorer does, all right? Same exact layout. We have the left navigation pane, which allows us to um, drill down to a specific folder. And then on the right side, or this main section, we can look inside that folder to see the files that are inside of it. Okay, so I know that I saved those two documents on my PC. So on the left navigation pane, I'll, I can click on this PC. All right, and that's basically this PC is your hard drive. All right, the hard drive that's saved on your that's installed on your computer already. If I click the little arrow next to it, it will drop. It will kind of open it up or drop down that menu to show me other options. So, so now inside this PC, it shows me a number of default folders, the ones we talked about earlier, the ones that come with Windows. Now I know that class samples is inside of the documents folder. So now if I expand the documents folder by clicking on that little arrow, on the left side, I now see the three subfolders that were inside of the main documents folder. Now, if I click on class samples on the left, you'll see that on the right, it's going to show me what's inside of the folder. So three, two, one, boom. Okay, so now these are all the files that are located inside of the class samples subfolder. And we see the file path again up here, just to verify that I am in fact inside of the class samples subfolder. And if I look down, right now these are arranged alphabetically. I see WB Practice 1 here and WB Practice 2 here. Okay, you can sort these differently. So you can sort your files alphabetically A to Z. You could sort them Z to A. You can sort them by date modified. Okay, so if you'd rather have your most recent files at the top, and your oldest ones at the bottom, you can arrange them that way, or vice versa, oldest at top, newest at the bottom. You can arrange them by um, the type of file, Excel files, uh, whatever, you know, it might be a Word document, it might be a PDF, so we'll arrange them by type. You can also arrange them by size, smallest to largest, largest to smallest. And you basically do, do that by just clicking on those respective labels, name, date modified, type, size. And you just establish if you want it a to Z, Z to A, oldest to newest, newest to oldest, smallest to largest, largest to smallest. All right, but again, what I really want you to uh, take away from this is just the, the fundamentals of using File Explorer. We open it up, uh, gives us access to our main folders and other parts of the computer, by the way, not just these main folders. And then we can get into those main folders to get to, to, get to all the files located in whatever folder we need to get to. And by the way, if I double click on, let's say WB practice one, if I double click it, it will reopen that file in its respective program like so. And now I'm right back to it and I can, continue, I can continue working on it again. And just remember, if you start making changes to a file, if you start adding information, uh, or making any changes of any kind, if you want to make sure you just update the file by saving it again. You don't need to do the whole save as process again. Okay, you most likely won't have to do that. You just need to do a quick save, which is usually done by just going to the file menu and clicking on save here, not save as, just save. And that will just save any updates you've made to that file, whether it's in Word, Excel, or another program. Doesn't have to be a Microsoft program, really. Again, any program that allows you to save your work will allow you to save changes. Let me close this again. I'm going to the upper right hand corner, clicking on the X.
And I'm going to close File Explorer by going to the upper right corner here, clicking on this X. Notice the same Windows display controls. All right, minimize, um, restore down, and the X to close. Minimize, restore down, X to close. And I forgot to mention this. If you are restored down like this, that restored down icon turns into the maximized icon. So notice instead of two little windows in front and back of each other, now it's just one big window. So if I click on that, I'll be back to full screen, like so. So that's maximized, this is restored down. Maximize, restore down, maximize, and I'll click on the X now to close it. All right, so last but not least, um, we're just about wrapped up here, but I just wanna remind you. So let's just say I'm done, okay? I saved my work. I closed Microsoft Word. I'm all done for the day. I wanna shut down my computer. So the first step is basically done. I saved my work. Whenever you shut down your computer, you should always be sure to save your work. All right, it's very important because you don't wanna lose anything, any, uh, any important information. Um, same thing if you're using a web browser. If you're familiar, if you're familiar with bookmarking, in a web browser, you can save websites um, to a list so you can get to them again next time. You can also bookmark anything before you shut down. Once you've done all that, then you can close your programs, all right? If you click shut down, it's gonna close them for you automatically, uh, but it tends to work faster if you shut them down first, if you close the programs first, excuse me. And we do that by just going to the programs and closing the windows inside those programs. All right, until the program is completely shut down. Um, you can also just right click on the icon in your taskbar. All right, and you'll see close all windows at the bottom of that menu. That will just close them all and then close the program down in one shot instead of having to close each and every window individually. So you saved your work, you closed your windows, Okay, and then uh, you shut that, you close the programs. Now you can go to your start menu, go to the power button right above the start menu icon, click on it, and then click on shut down. And that will then shut down your computer until the next time you need to, re to power it back on. All right, so if you have any further questions about what we covered today, now would be a good time to direct those questions through GoToMeeting's chat bubble. Click on the chat bubble and then type in your question and hit send. In the meantime, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go through a few closing uh, remarks here and then we'll be all set for the day. So thank you for coming to Windows 10 Basics today. The next class in our Windows series will be Windows 10 Essentials next week, February uh, Wednesday, February 9th at 10 a.m. And in that class, we're going to continue working in the Windows 10 environment, and we're going to talk more about customizing our Windows uh, display, essentially. All right, creating more access points, all right, pinning access points, creating shortcuts. And we'll also talk more about files and folders basically the entire life cycle of a file and folder from creating your own to giving it a new name to moving it copying it okay excuse me moving it copying it um, and then deleting it eventually all right so remember that this class was recorded and it will be available on our library's youtube channel under our computer instruction playlist so to get to that YouTube channel, click on the YouTube icon in the upper left-hand corner of our library website's homepage. So go to mcl.org, excuse me, I should say that first. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, click on the YouTube icon. That will take you to our YouTube channel, and then from there, go to Playlists, and then select the Computer Instruction Playlist.
All right. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning of class, remember we do have handouts for this class and many others. Okay. Um, most of our classes. So to get to those handouts, go to our library website at mcl.org. Click on services from the main menu and then click on technology instruction. Once you're on our technology instruction page, you can um, just scroll down and you'll see all the handouts listed by the name of the class. Also from that Save Technology Instruction page, from there you can sell, sign up for more classes yourself. All right, so just look for the register button. There's one for in-person, one for online. It doesn't matter which one you click. All right, they will take you to the same computer class calendar where you can register for more classes. Okay, just keep in mind, we um, all of our computer classes, like all of our other um, library programs, are virtual only um, until um, uh, hopefully by uh, February 14th, we'll be back to in-person and virtual options. All right, so just you can peruse through that computer class calendar or register for whatever classes interest you. Also keep in mind in that same calendar, you'll find links to our virtual private sessions where we work with just you individually on a computer project you might need some help with. Okay, um, so if, you're, if there's something you started and you just need some tips on kind of how to proceed, um, or maybe you have a device that needs some troubleshooting tips for, we can sometimes help with that too. Um, so just set up a private session. You'll see that in our calendar and just follow the instructions to book your 20 minute appointment. These take place on select Fridays between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Again, just reiterating that they are virtual only at this time. All right, if you have any other questions about our technology instruction program, you can send us an email to techclass at mcl.org. techclassmcl.org. Now, before I completely sign off, um, I did get a question. Now, if you, uh, for those of you who want to, um, if you need to leave, you can click on the X in the upper right-hand corner of GoToMeeting and then select Leave Meeting. If you are leaving us, thanks for coming, and we hope to see you again very soon, of course. Um, real quick, I did get a question, so I'm going to jump into that right now, and then um, if there are any other questions in the meantime, just send them my way. So, I got a question about antivirus software in Windows 10. So, um, Let's just kind of jump to that real quick. So first of all, uh, Windows 10 does come with its own antivirus program. It's called Windows Defender or Microsoft Defender. Um, let me just point you in that direction first. So um, if we go to our start menu, um, if we scroll down, let's see, is it in the main list here? Or do I, yeah, it is. Um, there is an app called Windows Security. All right, if we click on this, it's gonna open up our Windows Security app. I'll bring it to full screen. Okay, now, so this is your Windows Security app. Again, this comes with Windows 10, and it's just kind of giving you uh, kind of uh, links to all the different security features of your computer. Okay such as firewall, network protection, setting up virtual private networks, those kinds of things. Uh, but the one we're kind of focused on right now because we're talking about antivirus software is on the left here, this option for virus and threat protection. Okay, if I click on that, um, basically this will just give me a kind of a snapshot of, um, first of all, what, uh, in fact, let me see something real, I'm looking at something real quick here. Actually, yeah, it looks like this was changed. Okay, so anyway, so this will give me a snapshot of if there are any threats and also tell me what program, what any virus software I'm using to potentially to detect those potential threats. Um, it looks like they actually changed the layout of this probably with an update because it used to look a bit different. I'm just looking down to make sure. Yeah, so um, manage providers. I'm just looking real quick here.
Okay. So let me go back. Sorry. Um, on the right side of this fire sense threat protection, you will see a link to who's protecting me managed providers. And that's if you want to see what's currently running, you can click on that. And it looks like for antivirus, I have Microsoft Defender running. So this is a program that's actually already installed on your Windows 10 uh, computer. All right. Uh, but you can, if you want to, um, you can uh, select a different antivirus software to kind of be your primary antivirus software. Um, Microsoft Defender may not be the most comprehensive out there. To, uh, to my knowledge, it's very effective, but maybe you want to try something different just because um, you're, you're just more comfortable with it or, you were, or somebody told you it works great. So you can always install your own antivirus program and use that um, as your primary antivirus software. You just have to set that up here in this app, okay? And then you can elect to have Microsoft Defender kind of used as almost a backup. You can occasionally turn it on just to see if Microsoft Defender's detecting any threats. Uh, but generally speaking, the main uh, software program, antivirus software program that's running will be displayed in this main screen here under virus and threat protection. All right, so the current threats, all those kinds of things, it's gonna, it's gonna show you what is, um, what that particular program is detecting or not detecting, whether it's something like AVG, okay, um, uh, McAfee, I'm trying to think of others that are out there. Um, uh, Semantic, that's one we use here at the library sometimes. So if you download one of those third-party antivirus programs, you'll see that here, the name of it, and whether it's detecting any kind of threats or anything. And it's, it's very easy to sort of see what it's telling you, okay? Threats will be shown with a red X, and it, it will prompt you, it will basically say click here to see potential threats. If everything is good, you'll just see green check marks and then you're you're fine, okay? But it will alert you if it, if it detects any potential threats. And you could still, as you can see, typically run your own scan real quick. Even though it's doing it automatically, if you just wanna do another one, you could do, you can run your own antivirus scan manually here. Under virus and threat protection, which again is in your Windows security app which is on your Windows 10 computer. All right, and if you want a list of some very reputable and free um, antivirus programs, um, you'll actually find them in our Windows Advanced Handout. So in that, in that same webpage where we have all of our handouts, go to Windows Advanced, Windows 10 Advanced, and we do have a list of um, reputable, free and effective antivirus programs. Um, and if you can't find them or you, um, you can't find the handout or anything, you go just email us at techclass.mcl.org and we can provide you with that information. All right, um, so if there are no more questions at this time, let me just bring up my slide again with our email address here. All right, if there are no further questions, um, like I said, if you can go ahead and click on the X in the upper hand corner of the GoToMeeting window and then select the Leave Meeting. If you are leaving us, thanks so much for coming today. And we hope to see you again in class very soon. Take care.